And it wasn't something that somebody would say to them, shake it off. It was something that had to be dealt with. It had to be looked at. Our pain, your pain, needs to be validated. Whatever it is, it needs to be validated. In other words, you need somebody to tell you it's valid for you to hurt this way. It's not like when you're, when you're hurt and somebody, oh, it, it'll go away in a little while, just, just be tough, just hang it, just go away. You can't shake some pain off. You need to deal with it on a serious level. You need to talk to the Lord about it. You need to talk to people about it. You need somebody to say to you, I understand why you hurt. There's a good reason for you to hurt. Especially things that happen to us when we're young, when we don't have any control whatsoever. There's all kinds of abuse in the world. There's verbal abuse, there's emotional abuse, there's physical abuse and sexual abuse. And those things happen to us sometimes when we have no control over it whatsoever. That's most of the time it happens to us. And there's nothing you can do to change it. You can't go back and erase that. You can't do away with it. It's there. It's real. And if it's happened to you, it needs to be validated. You need to understand that that wasn't your fault. You need to, you need to understand that it doesn't make you less of a person because it happened to you. There are four facts that I want us to consider this morning. And I'm going to read these. I, I printed them in 14 fonts so I could see them because I'm suffering the pain of failing eyesight as most of us are as we get older. But here are these four facts. Now these aren't quotes from scripture but they are each one absolutely scriptural. Fact number one about you and about me. We have intrinsic value that is not dependent upon our breeding or our behavior or even how we feel about ourselves. Would you agree with that? First, you've got to find out oh, what's intrinsic mean, Marty. If you're not familiar with the word intrinsic, it means of itself. You have value. Period. You don't have value based on your breeding. It doesn't matter who your parents were. You have value regardless of who your parents were. Even if you don't know who your parents are, you have value as a human being. And that value is not dependent upon your behavior. Now, you might behave poorly. You might be one of the worst. As a matter of fact, I guess somewhere in the world, there's the worst person in the world. You ever thought about that? Somewhere in the world, there is the worst person in the world. Somebody's at the bottom of the moral pole, totem pole. That person think about it, still has, still retains intrinsic value. It's absolutely true. And it doesn't matter how we feel about ourselves. We might feel worthless, doesn't mean you are worthless. You might feel horrible, doesn't mean you are horrible. Doesn't matter. You and I both have intrinsic value. Fact number two, you didn't make yourself. You didn't get together with yourself someday and says, I think I'll be born. And this is what I'll be like when I'm born. You didn't do that. God made you. And guess whose image he made you in? You are created in the image of God. You didn't make yourself. God made you. And guess what kind of stuff God makes? He makes all things well. You are well made. You have intrinsic value and God made you. Those things really go together. Fact number three. No, three. I can't count. If you do not see yourself as valuable, it's because you or someone else has influenced you to think less of yourself than you ought. Well, that's kind of long. You might have to think about it, but some of you are grasping that pff, that fast because you understand what that means. Somebody has made you think less of yourself than you ought to think of yourself. Maybe it's you. Maybe you're part, taking part in this. Maybe you're complicit in it. But somewhere back in the history, maybe somebody's treated you in such a way, said something to you in such a way, said something about you in such a way that made you feel like you don't have as much value as you actually do. You know what we call that in intellectual circles? And I know what you're thinking, Marty. You don't know what an actual intellectual circle is. <laughs> <laughs> call that a lie if anybody tells you that you do not have value if you're telling yourself you don't have value that's a lie give it up it's not the truth 
you do have intrinsic value. God made you and he makes everything well. And if you think less of yourself than you ought, it's because somebody has lied to you. Maybe you have lied to you. And whoever's lied to you about that, you've believed it. Stop believing that and believe the truth about yourself. You have intrinsic value. God did make you. He made you the way he wanted you to be in the beginning. And there's a way for us to come back to what God wants us to be all the time. Fact number four, the best way to understand your value is through the cross. The best way to understand your value is through the cross. Just like Dwayne was talking about this morning. He mentioned John 3.16. We know what John 3.16 says to us. For God so loved the world. Now we think about that sometimes in terms of the world out there. But God loving the world makes no sense whatsoever unless it comes down to each individual individual. I didn't repeat myself. I wasn't being redundant. You are an individual individual. That means you're separate from everybody else with regard to your worth. You don't have to be connected to anybody to have worth, do you? You have worth all by yourself. That's where we started this whole thing. Your intrinsic value, the value you have in and of yourself. The fact that you're created in the image of God and God doesn't make junk, he makes good stuff and you're good stuff in the beginning. And if you don't think you're good stuff, somebody's lied to you and you've believed it and you need to quit believing that. And if you want to see how valuable you are in God's eyes, look at the cross. And I, I like this cross back here because it's an excellent reminder to us of the real cross, but the real cross wasn't anything like this one. We all know that. The real cross was rough and rugged and hard. The real cross sustained with our Savior's blood. The real cross bore him while he allowed himself to be affixed to it because he wanted to save you. He did want to save the world, yes, but he died for you as an individual. God knows who you are as an individual. He knows who I am. And he knows that none of us, none of us, none of us do the right thing all the time. And that's exactly why he died. If we could do the right thing, he would have said to us, get yourself straight, start doing the right thing, and your righteousness will save you. But did he say that? He didn't say that. He said through Jeremiah, the heart is deceitful. And our hearts are deceitful. You have worth. And if you've been hurt, it's not your fault. Now, I'm not talking about the things, the hurts that we have that are, that are ours because we're just stupid sometimes. If I go out and do something stupid and I get myself hurt, well, well, that is my fault. But I'm not talking about those. I'm talking about the hurts that we have in our lives that are because somebody else did something, because of circumstances. And there are plenty of those in the Bible. As a matter of fact, when you think about the gospel, you think about the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. But when you read through the gospels, what do you read about? You read about Jesus in touch with people on a daily basis, on a constant basis, who were hurting. Go back to, to Mark chapter 1. Mark chapter 1. Let's just look at a few of these examples of people who hurt and how Jesus dealt with them, how he helped them. You and I have pain in our lives. We want that pain to be comforted. We need it to be validated. And that's exactly what Jesus does all the time. Mark chapter 1, drop down to verse 40. And a leper came to Jesus, beseeching him and falling on his knees before him and saying, If you are willing, you can make me clean. A leper. You know about leprosy, don't you? You know it's a disease of the flesh. The flesh actually dies while it's on your body and it begins to decompose and come off. You're a horrible looking mess after leprosy has had you for a while. And if you read Leviticus chapter 13, God put provisions for leprosy in the law. And one of those provisions was in verse 45 that if you were leprous, you had to cover your, it says mustache, with your hand and call out unclean, unclean. And you had to stay away from people. You had to leave the camp and live by yourself until that infection left you. But the problem with leprosy was, it never left you. It's still an incurable disease. It can be controlled to some extent, but it still cannot be eradicated. So here's a leper coming to Jesus, falling down on his knees, saying, if you're willing, you can make me clean. Look at verse 41. 
What moved Jesus? Was it not compassion? Jesus was moved. Now when we say moved, when you read this in the English translation, Jesus was moved, what's that mean? That means something happened inside of him. Who was Jesus? He was God. Something happened inside of God. What did it cause him to do? He felt for this man. Now, you read about a man who's a leper. Just think about your life if you were a leper. Would there be some questions you'd be asking yourself? It's the same general questions, or they are the same general questions that we ask ourselves every time something bad happens to us or every time we're hurting. Why did this happen to me? Why me? You know the best answer for that I heard years ago. I don't remember the guy who said it, but I will always remember his response to that was, why not me? Oh, that's a good question. Why not me? After all, aren't we all sinners? Don't we all deserve death? Absolutely. Wasn't this man a sinner? You ever read about people like this or about this particular guy perhaps and wonder what was in his mind when he first realized he had leprosy? Was he asking the question, why me? Why did this happen to me? Have I done something horrible? Have I been a bad guy? Maybe it was uh, something he recalls from his youth when, when he didn't do what he was supposed to do and now I'm being punished for that. There's all kinds of crazy reasons we can come up with for why we're in pain. Why was he a leper? We have no idea. He just had leprosy. Now if you think all... Sickness and disease as a result of sin in someone's life. How do we explain sick babies? How do we explain little children who get these horrible diseases and these maladies? That's not it. That's not it. Jesus in verse 41 was moved with compassion. And it says, he stretched out his hand and touched him and he said to him, I am willing to be cleansed. Immediately the leprosy left him and he was cleansed and he sternly warned him and immediately sent him away and he said to him, see that you say nothing to anyone but go show yourself to the priest. Now why was he supposed to show himself to the priest? Because the law dictated that if you're cleansed of any kind of thing that's considered leprosy and there were other diseases that were considered leprosy, they weren't necessarily leprosy but they were diseases of the skin and, and if you were cured of that you'd go to the priest and you show yourself and you offer an offering and you give, you give thanks to God. That's what the law said to do. It said, go show yourself to the priest, offer for your cleansing what Moses commanded as a testimony to them. But he went out, this guy who was a leopard who came to Jesus, and Jesus had compassion on him and cleansed him. This guy went out and he began to proclaim it freely and to spread the news around to such an extent that Jesus could no longer publicly enter a city but stayed out in the unpopulated areas and they were coming to him from everywhere. Imagine that. What was wrong with this guy? Why didn't he keep it silent like Jesus told him? Why didn't he stay quiet? Would you? If you had leprosy, an incurable disease, if that disease separated you from the ones you loved and all of a sudden it's gone, would you be quiet about that? Now, now this isn't an ambush. But give this some thought. What's worse, leprosy or sin? Because all of us who are in pain have sin. Our pain not, might, be, may, might not be a result of our sin, but we have sin. If we come to Jesus with our sin, and He takes our sin away, and then He tells us, don't tell anybody, what would we do? Sometimes I wonder if the gospel might go out more powerfully into the world if Jesus had told us that. Don't tell anybody I've saved you. Don't tell anybody my blood has taken away your sin. I wonder if that might compel us to go out to the highways and the byways. But if your sin has been forgiven, have you been freed from any pain? I think we can relate to that. Chapter 2 of Mark. 
This, this is just the beginning. You can read through Mark, you can read through Matthew, you'll find the same stuff. When he come back to Capernaum several days afterward, it was heard that he was at home, and many were gathered together so that there was no longer room, not even near the door, and he was speaking the word to them. And they came, bringing to him a paralytic carried by four men. Being unable to get to him because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him, and when they had dug an opening, they let down the pallet on which the paralytic was lying. And Jesus, seeing their faith, said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. And some of the scribes were sitting there and reasoning in their hearts, Why does this man speak that way? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Were they right about that? They were right about that. What had they missed? This was God. That's what they had missed. Immediately, Jesus, aware in his spirit that they were reasoning that way within themselves, said to them, Why are you reasoning about these things in your hearts? Which is easier to say to the paralytic, Your sins are forgiven, or to say, Get up, pick up your pallet, and walk. But so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I say to you, Get up, pick up your pallet, and go home. What did he do? He got up immediately. He picked up the pallet, went out in the sight of everyone so that they were all amazed and were glorifying God, saying, we have never seen anything like this. I love that story. I love the one we just read about the leper. I love that Jesus has compassion on these people. And, and then I think, try to think some between the lines. If, if you were a paralytic and you had no ability to move your body, and all of a sudden you had ability to move your body, there would be sensations there that you hadn't had before. You would feel the relief. It would start with the physical aspect, of course, of being physically relieved and now physically able to move and get up. I'm sure that the guy had strength. I don't think God would have healed him from paralysis and made him a weak paralytic. Well, I can move around, but only kind of like this. What did this guy do? Immediately, he picked up the pallet and went out in the sight of everyone. He could move. He was strong. I wonder what he felt inside. Now think about it, if you're a paralytic, what would it be like to be totally paralyzed? In this day and age, it's bad enough. You've got all these things they can do for you in the hospital to sort of keep you clean and taken care of. They didn't have that stuff in those days. And here was a man who was in that condition, and yet he had enough friends, people who cared about him. They picked him up. They took him to Jesus. And when they couldn't get him in to see Jesus, they said, well, what else are we going to do? Well, let's just take him home. Forget about this. Too much trouble. What'd they do? Caught up on the top of the house. How do you get a paralytic on top of a house? Somebody has to carry him up there. You got up on top of the house. What are they going to do? Let him down the chimney? They tore the roof up. and they let the man down through the roof of the house. How bad did these friends want this guy to have some comfort? How bad did these guys want his pain and suffering to be validated? How bad did these people want to see some change in this man's life in a positive direction? Pretty bad. Pretty bad. I read about this and I think, am I that kind of friend? Do I see people hurting around me and take this kind of action, have this kind of tenacity to hang in there until something gets done? Do I try to bring them to Jesus so that something can be changed in their life, that this pain they're living is, with can be, can be alleviated, can be comforted, so that they can find strength and, and the hope and courage to go on? Am I that kind of friend? Now, I know that the miracles we see in the Bible aren't taking place anymore. At least I'm not seeing them happen. Does that mean that God's no longer comforting people? Doesn't mean that at all. I believe God is still the God of all comfort. Amen? Amen? It doesn't matter what happens to us. It doesn't matter what difficulties come our way. It doesn't matter how fair or unfair any of it is. And there's so much of it that's just totally unfair. But whatever it is, God will enable you to cope with that situation. He will give you that strength. When Paul wrote the letter, the first, well first letter we call it first corinthians chapter 10 he said this to them and this was in particular about sin but when i i think of sin i think of uh, the testing of our faith and i think that's exactly what this particular passage is making reference to first corinthians chapter 10 look with me here at verse 13 no temptation 
has overtaken you, but such as is common to man. And God's faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you're able, but with the temptation will provide the way of escape also, so that you will be able to endure it. I don't know what pain you're suffering in your life, but God will help you to endure that pain. He will help you to cope with that pain. He will help you to come to terms with that pain. That's what God does. He doesn't let you languish in it. He doesn't let you die in it. Remember what David wrote in the Psalms? Yea, that I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'll fear no evil. Your rod and your staff, they, they comfort me. That's what Paul is writing about in 2 Corinthians 1. That's really what Paul is writing about in 1 Corinthians 10, about God's comfort and His constant care of us, even when we are in difficult times of trouble like this. So many bad things can happen to us, and so many bad things do happen to us, but God is always there. In John chapter 9, there's an interesting account of a man, and, and what, I, what I think about here is that this was a man who was blind from birth. John chapter 9. We won't read the entire account, but it, it doesn't give his age. It just says that he was a man, and when he's asked about, because Jesus gives him his sight back, when he's asked about that, or his parents are asked about that, they say, go ask him, because he is of age. He's a full-grown man. This guy was blind from birth. Now, if you're the parent, what do you think when you have a child, and that child's born blind? What would be your natural thought? Worldly thoughts... The lies that this world has, oh, you've done something wrong. Why is that the question that the apostles ask? Look at verse, verses 1 and 2. As he passed by, he saw a man blind from birth, and his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he would be born blind? There's the assumption. It's one or the other. He sinned or his parents sinned. And I'm wondering, do you guys even realize what you're asking? <laughs> Did this guy sin to be born blind? Do you see the error in that line of thought? What did Jesus say? It was neither that this man sinned nor his parents, but it was so that the works of God might be displayed in him. Now we read this and we, we know what's coming. It's almost like Jesus is saying, oh, this is a setup situation because my works are going to be displayed in him. I don't know that that's what that means. We know he's going to be given back his sight, and everybody's going to, or, or a lot of people are going to come to faith over this because he's given sight. But, but I don't know that this was a set-up situation. What I do know is that this relates completely to the passage that John read for us in the beginning. If you look at John chapter, or uh, not John, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Keep in mind what we're reading here in, in John chapter 9. John chapter 9 and 2 Corinthians chapter 12. This is what Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 12, verse 7, once again. Paul says, Because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, for this reason, to keep me from exalting myself, there was given me a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me, to keep me from exalting myself. Now here's, here's a divine explanation for why Paul suffered this particular hurt. God didn't want him to get the big head. Paul's getting a lot of revelations. Most of the New Testament is attributed to the Apostle Paul. And so Paul says, because of all these abundant revelations, God gave me a thorn in the flesh so I wouldn't be thinking too highly of myself. So he says in verse 8, Concerning this, I implored the Lord three times that it might leave me. And he has said to me, My grace is sufficient for you. What in the world does that mean? We know it means, Paul, I'm not taking this problem away. You're going to have to live with this pain. But my grace is sufficient for you. My grace is sufficient to see you through this pain. What I can give you along with this pain will help you make it through. God doesn't say, shake it off, Paul. God says, my grace is sufficient for you. This is why, continuing in verse 9, power is perfected in weakness. And then Paul says, God said power is perfected in weakness, but Paul says, Most gladly, therefore, I'll rather boast about my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. Now, here's, a, here's kind of a dumb illustration of how that works. 
If you go out in my old pickup out there, underneath the back seat, you will find a, a big bundle of jumper cables. Oh, yeah, you know why I've got those in there. Because sometime in the past, my truck lacked power. I got jumper cables. All I need is somebody else with a vehicle and a good battery, and I can make the connection. And when I do that, my truck starts, and I'm home free. And I've had to do that in the past. And you've probably had to do that in the past. Now, how much time do you spend thinking about jumper cables on your daily walk of life? Not very much, likely. But when you're stranded and your car won't start, what do you think about jumper cables then? Oh man, how many of you have been in a place where you give $100 for a good pair of jumper cables? There you go. Because when you have the need, that's when it becomes important. And what Paul is saying is, when I'm weak, that's when God is strong. When does God work best? He works best when we're strong. When does God's comfort mean the most? It means the most when we're in pain. When does God come through for us? When we're in trouble. When I'm weak, God's strong. In my weakness, His power is perfected. You see the value of a good set of jumper cables when your car won't start. Amen? You see the value of God's grace when you're hurting. When you're hurting. I want to close this morning's lesson with a passage from 1 John chapter 5. And John wasn't necessarily talking about pain. He was talking about the difference between those who try to live righteously and those who embrace sin. When you look through John, he talks about those who were born again and those who were not. And this is what he says in 1 John chapter 5 and verse 1. Keep this in mind regarding any pain you might have and apply it like medicine on a regular basis. Whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and whoever loves the Father loves the child born of Him. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and observe His commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep His commandments, and His commandments are not burdensome. For whatever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. This is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Brothers and sisters, friends and neighbors, where do we have pain? In this world. Who has overcome the world? Jesus has overcome the world. How do we overcome the world as Jesus did? We put our faith in Him. That's how we do it. I don't know what you live with on a daily basis, but I know the answer is Jesus. I don't know how much you hurt or how deeply you hurt, but I know the answer is Jesus. That's not some trite preacher saying. That's an absolute fact. He made you, and he made you with intrinsic value. You have value in and of yourself. He made you in his own image. And if you think that you're something less than the image of God, you've believed a lie, and you need to put that lie away. And if you want to really get a good picture of how valuable you are to God, look at the cross. This morning, what do you want to do with your pain? It's real. You know it's real. I don't have to tell you that. But if there's pain in your life, it's caused by your own sin, God's got something for that. It's a simple plan. Put your faith in His Son as the Son of God. Repent of your sin. Confess His name. And let someone bury you in water. And you'll be buried into his death, his painful death, that you can rise from that death to walk in newness of life. If that's what you want to do this morning, we want to help you with that. We want to help rid you of that sin pain. If there's any other pain we can help you with through prayer, through just talking with you, we want to do that as well. Just come forward so we know how we can help you while we stand and sing the invitation song together.